السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Welcome everybody from around the world. We are happy to see you. This is Face the Truth. I am your host Bilal Abdul Kareem, and today we have our guest. He has been here before, and he is uh, someone who is going to help us to understand some nuances surrounding a very important topic, which is governance. Governance in Islam or governance period. How do we understand this? And he is uh, Sheikh Abu Suleiman El Australi, also known as uh, Mustafa Muhammad. And I want to say to you, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, we've got a lot of ground to cover, lots of ground to cover. So we're going to jump right into this thing. Um, I just want to let everybody know something before we begin. The purpose of what we are going to be discussing here today. Some things you and me and him and all, we may not agree, but the purpose is that we need to establish a dialogue. So put your comments below, agree, don't agree, thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, if you put the thumbs up for me, it's okay, no problem. I'm gonna be all right with that, but uh, we'll see where the way it goes. Um, Islamic governance or just governance in, in general exactly what are the responsibilities for the leadership to the people? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. First of all, thank you for having me on the show. Um, and the topic is extremely difficult to address in one session or one, uh, one episode, but I'll try my best to, to shed some light on this matter. And governance is, is the responsibility of those that have uh, vouched to serve the people. So it's a service you're providing and not a leadership that you have taken uh, by force or by, uh, by means of um, that aren't, means that aren't, uh, that don't reflect the people's will. So the people should be, have elected should have elected these, 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 these governors or these rulers or these leaders to serve their needs. The needs of people differ from place to place and from time to time. So it's very difficult to then say uh, the ro role of a government is to serve the people in only these fields. Rather, um, as time progresses, as uh, technology develops and as um, the needs of the people change, the government should be able to provide those needs to those people. Okay? Um, from an Islamic perspective, uh, we have a very important foundation in Islam, and that is our role as Muslims uh, in this life is described very particularly in the Quran and Sunnah, and that we are servants of Allah. We live this life trying to please Allah, trying to attain His pleasure. And by doing so, we will live happily because Allah tells us what to do that will benefit us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that means, from the, from, from the perspective of a governor or a leader, that he must rule by what Allah has told him to rule by and not try to come up with something new. Uh, now, every government has an ideology they build their government on. Mm -hmm. If it's democracy, for example, they build their, their, their government on uh, you know, the concept of freedom and liberalism and whatnot. Um, At least in theory, but go ahead. In theory, mm -hmm. definitely in theory. I mean, we can get into the, the discussion of, of is there really a democracy mm -hmm. on the face of the earth today? And when the argument is put forward by people that... Uh, people that consider themselves democratic mm -hmm. in nature, they say that there's no real democracy unless it's a direct democracy, a direct representation of the people, mm -hmm. rather than a representative democracy which takes you know, a small number of people that have the power and the resources and the, you know, they rule the machine in mm -hmm. any society and then they fund these campaigns to change the minds of people and make them believe that they're being represented mm -hmm. in society. One of the biggest um, you know, living proofs of mm -hmm a democracy not being established is America right now. But anyway, we'll, come back, we'll get back to that later if you want. Um, 
So in Islam, we have the concept of Allah telling us how to live our lives. Now that doesn't mean we believe in a theocracy. You know, theocracy is very different to what Islam wants from the Muslims in this life. A theocracy is a, a concept that existed in the church and that's the whole reason why there was a revolution against the church because there was a clergy mm -hmm. and this um, select few number of priests represented God. What they said was divine and what they decided was rule and the king that was placed at that time was God's wish and God's desire on this earth and you couldn't really uh, revolt against this king. Mm -hmm. In Islam, we haven't got any of that. We haven't got any infallibility to an imam or a ruler. These rulers are representatives of the people and trying to implement the rule of God on this earth. But if they fall into error, they should be judged. Mm -hmm. And if they fall into, uh, uh, you know, if they, start, if they stop serving the people and their needs, they should be removed. Okay, but now you, you're going into some dangerous territory here because uh, many people have been reared on the concept that so long as the ruler establishes the prayer, then there should be no revolting against him. Uh, I agree that this concept has been uh, misunderstood, but I think the people that have misunderstood it are kind of dying out now. It was really, um, and it's based on a hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, Madama yuqimu fikum salah, as long as he establishes salah amongst you. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that really, it was a hadith that was misinterpreted intentionally or unintentionally by a group of people that were trying to advocate the, the rule of the Saudis in particular because that's where the idea was, you know, kind of, kind of spread from. So how do we all. understand it? Well, the hadith um, suggests that the ruler, if he performs his salah, not on his own, not in his quarters, but that is a representation of his role towards Allah that he uh, he's a Muslim and as a Muslim he will be fulfilling his duties towards the people and uh, that on its own isn't sufficient mm -hmm. you know, the Salah on its own isn't sufficient he needs to be performing, performing all his duties mm -hmm. and if he performs his Salah but doesn't perform other duties which should come as a natural consequence of Salah as a natural result of Salah you know, if you're worshipping Allah alone and you are doing this uh, con consistently and continuously and the people are in the, in the mosques and they're praying and you're advocating this and you're supporting this, then you should be also looking to fulfill the other obligations of Allah. Now, if you stop doing all of these things and you let them worship Allah on their own and you uh, steal their wealth and you rule them by force and you oppress them, and you ally with their enemies to kill them or kill some of them and you imprison others and you, uh, you silence the people that would like to speak the truth mm -hmm. and all of these things then no, then you're not really ruling by Allah's law anymore and that's the concept, the core of the core of the rule in Islam is that you rule justly Why are we seeing more uh, political thought in the Muslim world uh, a lot of the concepts that we have, um, I think by anybody's account you would have to admit that some of the concepts and some of the fatawa that people use are based upon conditions that were a thousand years old or 700 years old. The, the, the foundation of the religion is there. But wh why aren't we seeing more books, more discussions about uh, uh, how somebody should become the leader? It, it, why aren't we seeing that? Well, first of all, if we look at the history of Islam, the history of Islam is very clear on how a person should be, uh, should be elected or how he should come into power uh, Islamically, from an Islamic perspective. I'm not talking about the natural behavior of human beings. Natural behavior of human beings, there's hatred, there's animosity, there's this, seek, uh, there's this desire to seek revenge and one should fight these desires as a Muslim mm. but you know people are inclined to follow these desires and kill others and then take mm. power by force and whatnot so if we look at Islam and what it has to say about political thought uh, 
uh, that had uh, يعني, that had to be fought by many people that didn't want what Islam had to say mm. uh, namely the people in charge the people in power mm. leaders at that, uh, leaders at different times mm. didn't want scholars to talk about Islamic thought uh, in politics didn't want to talk about justice didn't want to talk about uh, equality didn't talk about freedom uh, so they hushed them they imprisoned them or they got them busy in other fields mm. Yes, they, we do have a few books on uh, siyasa sharia or Islamic politics, if you want to. No, call but it. I mean, but but they're they're few. Very few. Like even if you if you look now, um, I don't know if any real Muslim. I'm not a tech fury. I'm just putting you know the word real out there. Let alone any ulama that would look and see what's happening in Yemen. The, 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 see, I, people are failing to realize something that those images that you may be seeing. Um, regarding people who are starved, they look like skeletons. These are Muslims. And how is this coming about? And at whose hands is this coming about? The Saudi Arabian government backed by America, but this narrative is not even discussed in, in, in these circles of well, scholarly. scholarly uh, um, I think politics is very, a very scary topic for Muslims to talk about today because of the oppression they they face if they were to talk about politics. And mm -hmm. I don't excuse Muslims, especially scholars, mm -hmm. for not talking about what's important to the world. And it's not just an Islamic issue, it's a hum hu humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. where people are dying and others are watching. So, but I, I don't want to stray from the topic. But let's, let's go back about Islam okay. and how Islam uh, saw mm -hmm. politics initially. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we were to go back at the time of Medina, okay. the Prophet وسلم, when he went into Medina and established his first the government before he went to Medina, there was Surah Al Shura, which is the basis of Islamic rule. Shura, okay. A Shura is not a democracy. Let's make that distinction distinction very clear from the beginning. A Shura is a way where uh, consultation should be made amongst the people before decisions are made. Surah Al Shura was delivered or uh, was um, delivered to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mm -hmm in the time of Mecca, before he went to Medina and established his state. Okay? And Allah Azza wa told him, So take their opinion in matter, matters of the, uh, in their matters. Mm -hmm. In their matters, uh, meaning their matters of ruling. Yes. Okay? So it shouldn't be a matter taken on his own. Even though he was the Prophet and he received revelation, so Allah could and have he told could have him just done anything he wanted to do and who was going to say who was going to Allah told me mm -hmm. he could have just used that excuse and it so could have been that that, that 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 case but what about elections I'll get to that in a moment mm -hmm. how how he should become into power but the mm -hmm. prophet when he went to Medina mm -hmm. one very important concept that he tried to establish was the the concept of community mm -hmm. the community was was the the core of of uh, the establishment of the, of the uh, of the state and he made pacts and agreements with the people, even the Jews. And the, in the hadith of Sahih Muslim, Prophet Sallam said, وَأَنَّ يَهُودَ بَنِي عَوْفٍ أُمَّةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ مَعَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ I'll translate. Mm -hmm. That the Jews of Bani Awf are one nation with the believers. That was one of the conditions the Prophet Sallam wrote when he entered Medina. Now, some people might not like this. And that's up to them, but this is a hadith. This is mm -hmm. the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu talking. And, and, and that's the community he built, mm -hmm. had minorities, and they were considered as one nation, one political entity. Mm -hmm. okay? They had rights, they had obligations towards their nation, and they were considered as allies to one another mm -hmm. in uh, certain respects. But you see, it now, is, when there's a prophet, and there was at that time, um, things are a bit easier. There's only. There's, you know, you don't have to guess who the leader is going to be, and you don't have to guess what kind of term he's going to have. You know, it's going to be until he dies, of course. But how do we go about choosing leaders? For example, I, I keep I'm going to come back to this again. Elections. Yep. Can we have elections? Well, it, uh, 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 you know, or or is this un-Islamic? Let's look at when, for example, Abu Bakr radiAllahu anhu. Once the Prophet ﷺ died. Abu Bakr, the first caliph, a khalifa of the Prophet Sallallahu he received power from him and Umar gave him a pledge of allegiance. Umar gave him a pledge of allegiance. The scholars say that
that this Pledge of Allegiance meant nothing until the people recognized the leadership of Abu Bakr. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, he became the Khalifa. So this is very important. He was uh, nominated, but then he was also recognized. This recognition mm -hmm. is the most important thing. Now how that recognition comes about, that's another story. It can happen through elections, it can happen through nomination, it can, it can happen through uh, a tawsiyah where, where the Khalifa before him considers this person to be the most mm -hmm. uh, suitable, so he appoints him. But that appointment isn't set in concrete until the people recognize it. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? And when Umar radiallahu anhu, he died, uh, he gathered six people together and they were real representatives of the Muhajireen and the Ansar and the people that were in that community. Mm -hmm. And these people then agreed together who they should nominate. And there was a difference amongst them. Some said Ali, some said Uthman, but it wasn't set in concrete who would come again, uh, again after Umar radiallahu anhu until the people recognized this leadership and they gave them their uh, their right to rule. So you're saying there's nothing wrong with having elections? There's nothing wrong with having so elections. So when does having elections cross the line from shura to democracy? Oh, elections have nothing to do with shura and democracy. There's three different issues we're talking about here. But if elections are the kind of elections they, ha they have in America where uh, they have campaigns to smear reputations and these are run by huge companies. Mm -hmm. The multimillionaires are the ones who really run the show and feed people in the community what they want them to understand the reality is. Um, then that, that's not really getting the real representation of the people mm -hmm. to, to government. And no one can really uh, represent the people mm -hmm. fairly mm -hmm. in a society that's built on money like this. A capitalistic society like this that that uh, that has an institution that runs everything yeah. even even Donald Trump if, if he wasn't the millionaire multimillionaire he was and he didn't join the Republican Party he couldn't have done anything mm -hmm. right so what we're trying to say is that there's those kind of elections mm -hmm. and then there's there are elections that are real represent that, that, that really tell you what the people want to want to say mm -hmm. okay tell me, if that can happen then that's fine now, democracy mm -hmm. and shura mm -hmm. are different in many regards. And mm -hmm. like I said, this is a very short episode, but the, uh, the main difference, I guess, between a democracy and uh, a shura is that a shura is a way of getting the people's opinions to make a, a final decision on a matter. So w w what and do you I say about this concept? There is, uh, we'll say that uh, the government has adopted that the Quran and the Sunnah is the Constitution. It's inviolable. Uh, but at the same time, the leaders can be elected. Does that fly or not? That's fine. Islamically. That's fine, Islamically. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, on the contrary, that, that's what should happen. So w what if someone as, uh, uh, assumes the leadership role? He's the president or the emir or whatever that you want to say that it is. And is he the leader and that's it? I mean, when can the people rebel against him? Well, they shouldn't rebel against him uh, if he's fulfilling his obligations towards them and he's uh, serving them uh, as he should, as he should. Now, who decides if he's serving them as they should? Mm -hmm. First of all, there should be set parameters for how he should be, uh, how he should be judged. Mm -hmm. And how do we, how do we consider this, this ruler to be a good ruler or a bad ruler. There should be parameters. It shouldn't be left to the opinion of, of every Tom, Dick or Harry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. there should be something to rule against and that's the Quran and Sunnah first and foremost. Mm -hmm. But then we have the needs of society. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the needs of society, are, uh, yani, they're not different from, from, from one town to another. So, so when in, the needs of the people such, are not met, no. They can be, uh, um, the leader can be, when I say rebel, I don't want to necessarily give people the connotation that means that they're going to throw a petrol bomb th through the municipality office. They have to demand that he be removed or the reform needs to be made. That They, they, need, to be, they need to voice their opinion. Mm -hmm. They need to voice their opinion mm -hmm. in order for these changes to be made. Now, if those changes aren't made, then, I mean, it's a long process, but I mean, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, they have the right to uh, remove any, any leader mm -hmm. that they believe 
as a whole, as a community, they, they, that they believe doesn't represent them. Right. We now have in these free territories a new government. Mm -hmm. um, it is headed by Dr. Mohammed Sheikh. Mm -hmm. um, alhamdulillah, we did here on OGN a, uh, an interview with him. I think you've seen the interview. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he, basically, his portfolio are the free territories, not including Al-Bab. We're talking about Idlib and other places um, um, around. What are your thoughts? I think it's very early to judge. I think uh, he has a, a big responsibility to fulfill to the people before talking about the factions that exist in, in Syria. Um, he says he's independent of the factions. I, I really don't know how uh, an armed force can exist when the factions, uh, this armed force, I mean, they can exist at the same time as a government and they're completely independent. There needs to be a relationship between a government and uh, the policing power. So what is this government exactly? I still mm -hmm. really don't understand he, he the role of the government. He said in his interview that, uh, they're, um, that they are hoping to, uh, m to, to put them under one um, umbrella, that, and this is what he's working towards. Okay, so what I, what I came out, what I understood from the interview was that he wants to establish security in Syria, and he wants to, um, so it was one, one was security and the second was um, la ilaha illallah. Well, he wants to establish security. He wants to, um, uh, 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 you know, there's a finance minister. He's got a cabinet. Um, he's trying to put together a proper government. What are his responsibilities? That's a better question. What are his responsibilities to the people right now? Okay, so uh, like I said, a government really needs to understand its role towards a society. There is no constitution right now. Okay. There is no constitution, so the first thing they need to be proposing is a constitution that the people will accept. Okay. Okay? And if, if you were to propose a constitution and the whole society just rejects your presence, you can't really rule them unless you rule them by force. And this is the problem the Ummah has been facing for a very long time. Since the, the fall of the Khilafah, okay, there have been efforts to re-establish ki some kind of Khilafah. Some of them have been uh, complete failures, all of them have failed because one or more than one reason. Some have failed because there's no real representation of the Ummah. Some have failed like, like uh, Baghdadi and his group, there's no real representation of the Ummah or even his society, his small community that he lives amongst. They're completely foreign, they're completely uh, you know, disassociated from the rest of the world, mm -hmm. they're alienated. Mm -hmm. um, some are because what they're trying to implement isn't at par mm -hmm. with what the people need. But this is a step in the right direction. I'll get to that in a moment. And, and, and then some, after they look at you know, the failure of the establishment of the Khilafah, they say, well, look, since the Khilafah can't be established, and you know, it's such a foreign idea, even though it existed 90 years ago, just 90 years ago, mm -hmm. the yeah, Khilafah to, existed. To, to some extent. Okay. It, it existed. Mm -hmm. It existed, and it played a role, even if it was weak. And we can talk about the weaknesses in the, the, the Ottoman Empire at the time, but it existed. It's not an idea that came from, you know, from the time of Athens, for example, like mm -hmm. democracy. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. We're not talking about something ancient mm -hmm. that people are trying, trying to implement today. That's an idea of history, mm -hmm. but people are striving for it and trying to implement it. So uh, the Khilafah existed not long ago, and people uh, have been trying to establish something slowly. Uh, now, I'm not saying there's a jump that needs to be made from a nothing to a Khilafah. That's a huge step. Mm -hmm. The step that needs to be made is a model for this Khilafah, mm -hmm. a mini Khilafah, in a smaller state. Okay. Now, the problem people, mm -hmm. people face is that we can't do the Khilafah. Let's go borrow a model. Mm -hmm. Let's go take a model from some other country. Let's go to democracy. Why is it either this or that? Mm -hmm. Why can't it be something that the Muslims themselves come up with? So, but, but, so the average person now that lives in these free territories, what kind of responsibility do they have, they have a, towards this new government? They have no responsibility towards this government until the government proves themselves. They need to provide safety and security. They need to feed the people. They need to provide them housing. The people living in shelters. But, that, living but, in but that shouldn't, it go, uh, shouldn't it go hand in hand? I mean, sh should the people just say, carry me, carry me? Um, shouldn't they also Do what? be towards willing? A, towards a government that doesn't exist yet? 
what, once it starts existing, it starts providing something, then we can say, yes, there needs to be cooperation. There needs to be, uh, you know, when they prove that they're going to be fair mm -hmm. and they're going to be just and mm -hmm. they're going to treat minorities fairly. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and the, I mean, we have Idlib right now, which has gathered all of these different types of people, okay, from all over Syria, but they're all Sunnis. Mm -hmm. And then we have the other minorities like the Christians, and we have some Druze, and we have all of these people bunched up in one area. How are you going to rule these people? How are you going to provide them what they need mm -hmm. in their day-to-day -day lives? See, I understand the challenges. The and challenges they, and are they there. And represent them politically, mm -hmm. not just in Syria, outside of Syria. When you talk, mm -hmm. you're talking mm -hmm. on behalf of them. So mm -hmm. that's what he's got to do first. And then the people see this. Mm -hmm. They're going to recognize him. Why can't it go hand in hand? Well, they need to do, he, something needs to happen first, right? Something needs to happen first. So they need to provide before they, they ask people to, to listen. So once they start doing something, they go, you know what, we're behind these mm. people. But mm. I, I personally, I personally, I'm not going to start clapping for, for an, a president that I don't know. I know nothing about. I don't know his, his plans for the future. I don't know if he can do it or not. I don't know. I mean, everything's still very shady. So let's see. Let's mm. wait and see. Now, see, that's something, um, you know, you uh, grew up in Australia. I grew up in New York. Um, and we grew up in democratic societies where the leadership actually had to show the people, this is what I plan to do. Now, ultimately, if they you know, do that or they don't do that, which a lot of times they don't do, um, at least there's something that you could hold them to accountable for. There's, to some level, there's transparency. You said you were going to do A, B, and C. You didn't do that. Why? Unfortunately, we have a culture um, here in these uh, uh, Muslim societies where there is no transparency. No one can say, uh, you can call me to account for this promise that I made because I didn't promise you anything. See, the problem is this. In Islam, it's the complete opposite. You know, where the individual can ask the Khalifa where he got his money from. When the Prophet Sallallahu helped some, uh, some fur from the, uh, from the hair of a camel, and he said, I don't own the wealth of the Muslims, not even this much. Not even this much. What I own is the fifth of the wealth that comes back to me and goes back to you. They spent, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't have any money that was inherited. Mm. When Umar radiallahu anhu stood up on the pulpit and uh, he was questioned mm -hmm. by an individual in, in the sermon, an individual stood up and said, I will not listen to you and I will not obey you until you tell us where you got your garment from. Because the garments were, were distributed at a time mm -hmm. amongst the Muslims and everyone got a piece of, their, of this garment. But Omar was a very tall man and he had two pieces. So where did you get this from? So he had this right to ask him. Mm -hmm. When Uthman radiallahu anhu, he was killed by people that came to question him. Mm -hmm. So that was a normal thing and the Sahaba was standing outside the door. They were standing outside his door mm. and people came in to question him about his behavior, about his wealth, about what he's doing, about his policies. Now that's the kind of behavior we need to come back to. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of culture we need to reignite and mm. reintroduce to our society because that's what we were upon once upon mm. a time. Today, rulers go... They have no access. They, 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 they there's no access to them. There's no access and there's, there's no accountability. They can do whatever they want unquestioned. They go about their daily uh, lives and their political lives and their personal lives unquestioned. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't exist in Islam. In, in the West we have, you know, audits and whatnot and watchdogs and mm -hmm. people that... But in Islam, that right of questioning exists with the individual mm -hmm. towards, his, towards his leader, not just with institutions or organizations mm -hmm. or officers. Well, look, this is a, a, a big topic. We're going to have to uh, try to dissect this in more than one uh, a setting, and I, I realize that. Um, unfortunately, we're just about out of time. Um, I want to let you have the last word. And, you know, and I don't usually like to give people the last word, you know, especially him, because we don't always agree, <laughs> as you can see. But the reality is that we've got a new government right here, right now. If you could say something to him, who is the president, and you're talking directly to him, because they do watch our programs and we do, uh, uh, do interviews with this new government, 
and you're talking directly to him, Dr. Muhammad al-Sheikh, what would you say to him? Well, I'd say to him that he needs to be actively representative of the people. That's number one. Number two, the problems that we face here in Syria, uh, and first and foremost the Syrians that, uh, that they are paying the price for all of these problems, day in and day out, he now is responsible for fixing these problems. Okay? If he can't find a way to secure them from each other, I mean just a few days ago or a few weeks ago, there was infighting between Hayat Tahrir al-Sham and Harakat uh, Nuruddin Zinki. They were at each other's throats, they were killing each other. Mm -hmm. All these Islamic justifications, right? They should stop talking about Islam and stop saying that they are representatives of Islam if they're going to be killing each other. And then the next day, kissing and making up as if nothing happened. These people need to be brought to justice. Then these people need to be questioned. And if a government can't do that, then what kind of government are they? What if he says, to, uh, what if he says, um, Abu Suleiman, you got some good ideas. We need somebody to roll up their sleeves and get to work. Come and help us out. I, I don't represent the Syrian people. I, Nobody asked if you represented the Syrian people. I myself, I, you know, as everybody knows, I'm not Syrian. I, 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 I would be honored to, to serve the Syrian people in whichever way I can. But I personally believe at this time, uh, a government that represents the Syrian people needs to be from them. Needs to be from them. That is the wisest thing to do. It shouldn't be made up of people that do not uh, share their culture, do not understand the, the intricacies of their, their history uh, as much as they do. Okay? As much as I'd like to believe I'm you know, aware of their problems, I'm still uh, getting to know a lot of these people, mm -hmm. getting, to, getting to know their cultures and their customs and their differences and uh, the disparities that exist from, from tribe to tribe, from uh, city to city. So I would be honored to help in whichever way I can, but the, the government that exists, and I think they're aware of this as well, needs to be a fully Syrian government that uh, represents the people and their dreams, their aspirations, and their, mm -hmm. and, and their desire, inshallah, to live. All right, now I'm gonna go back on what I said, and I'm gonna have the last word, because this is my <laughs> show, you know, I have the opportunity to do that. Look. This, these are my thoughts. These are just very general, and this is not specific to any one person, either you or to myself or anything like that. I think that, um, that this land, which is here in Syria, is, uh, this is the, the, the home of the Syrian people. But at the same time, if you'll look at countries like Israel, most of those people are from Russia, Poland, and other places, and they've come together to help to build a society. Unfortunately, it's on somebody else's land, but they've come together to build a society, and they've got a functioning society because you've got all different ideas and concepts that have come together. Did you say Israel or did you say America? Because that's the same thing in America and Australia and every, and every, every other colonization in the world. We can use these terms interchangeably. The, 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 the point of the matter is, is that when you look even in the early stages of this uh, civil war, if you want to call it that, there were um, a lot, uh, there's a lot of participation, uh, like it is now, of foreign fighters, foreign um, ideas on the battlefields and such like that. And many gains were taken, I think, and I attribute a good portion of that to some foreign uh, um, expertise that came to the thing. That doesn't exclude the fact that the Syrians carried the brunt of that weight. 100%. No, no question about that. 100%. But the issue is, is that when you've got all of these different ideas, different concepts, uh, different people who are bringing fresh ideas to the table, these uh, Arab lands, uh, 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 educationally and, and, and in other uh, uh, spheres, have been so stagnant. And now when we're looking, we're in s seven years deep into the Civil War. I think by everybody's account, even I think you would have to admit, we need some new ideas here. I think that just rehashing the same uh, um, uh, Syrian ideas, because the people who are involved in the political sphere na now have no uh, experience. They were not allowed to have experience in the time of Bashar al-Assad. So why not benefit from the experiences of a muhajir? That's fine, that's fine. I mean, if, if, uh, if Syrians want to learn new things and, uh, and acquire new types of knowledge, that's, that's fine. They do that. And they've been doing that for a while. Since the beginning of this uprising, they've been going to Turkey and getting courses in Turkey and, 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 
And, uh, well, why would, you, why would you have a guy to, 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 to get a course when he's been doing, when you have somebody else who's been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years? Yeah. There's no comparison there. Of course not, of course not. But I, like I said, uh, let's, and there are two different issues we're talking about here. One is the representation of the Syrian people, and I believe that should be done by Syrians. Mm -hmm. But um, helping in any kind of way, in any, in any kind of way, if that can be done by anyone in Syria or outside of Syria, that wants to help this cause, I think they should be more than welcome to do so. When the whole world has abandoned these people and turned a blind eye, mm. I think um, it's an honorable thing to do, to give up your time, your safety, your security, your wealth, um, to help these people, not as a favor, but as an obligation. Mm -hmm. An obligation, okay. an Islamic obligation, a, uh, yeah, that's something that Allah Azza wa has asked us to do for each other. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. We want to see your comments below. You agree? You don't agree? Don't just put up there and say, no, no, bad concept. Okay, we've talked about a lot of concepts. Which one is it? Because we may be dealing with this topic again in the future. I am Bilal Abdul Karim. I would like to thank my guest, uh, um, Sheikh Abu Suleiman, El Australi, Mustafa Muhammad. Jazakum Allahu Khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.